Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, welcome. It looks like everybody's in high spirits, high energy. I think I'm assuming it's because we're all here in sunny, beautiful Lisbon. So we're going to try to keep those spirits high and that energy high, and we're going to directly go into a video, a short video. Um, and then afterwards, I will introduce our panelists, I'll introduce myself, and I'll run through the agenda for the session. Um, so we're also kicking off with this video because we recognize that the topic of discussion today is, yes, blockchain. So uh, we know that we may all be talking about, about blockchain, blockchain technologies. Um, we may all be talking about it, but I think that many of us also feel that we're not sure if we're talking about the right thing or the same thing as the person that we're talking with, et cetera. So one of the themes of today is actually gonna be just that. It's, it's what we know and what we don't know. Because um, I think collectively we understand that there's still, there's still a lot to understand and learn about this topic. So let's start with this video just to align around some basic information. Many people think of blockchain as the technology that powers Bitcoin. While this was its original purpose, blockchain is capable of so much more. Despite the sound of the word, there's not just one blockchain. Blockchain is shorthand for a whole suite of distributed ledger technologies that can be programmed to record and track anything of value, from financial transactions to medical records or even land titles. You might be thinking, we already have processes in place to track data. What's so special about blockchain? Let's break down the reasons why blockchain technology stands to revolutionize the way we interact with each other. Reason number one, the way it tracks and stores data. Blockchain stores information in batches called blocks that are linked together in a chronological fashion to form a continuous line, metaphorically a chain of blocks. If you make a change to the information recorded in a particular block, you don't rewrite it. Instead, the change is stored in a new block, showing that X changed to Y at a particular date and time. Sound familiar? That's because blockchain is based on the centuries-old method of the general financial ledger. It's a non-destructive way to track data changes over time. Here's one example. Let's say there was a dispute between Anne and her brother Steve over who owns a piece of land that's been in the family for years. Because blockchain technology uses the ledger method, there is an entry in the ledger showing that Adam first owned the property in 1900. When Adam sold the property to Dave in 1930, a new entry was made in the ledger, and so on. Every change of ownership of this property is represented by a new entry in the ledger right up until Anne bought it from their father in 2007. Anne is the current owner, and we can see that history in the ledger. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Unlike the age-old ledger method, originally a book, then a database file stored on a single system, blockchain was designed to be decentralized and distributed across a large network of computers. This decentralizing of information reduces the ability for data tampering and brings us to the second factor that makes blockchain unique. It creates trust in the data. Before a block can be added to the chain, a few things have to happen. First, a cryptographic puzzle must be solved, thus creating the block. The computer that solves the puzzle shares the solution to all of the other computers on the network. This is called proof of work. The network will then verify this proof of work, and if correct, the block will be added to the chain. The combination of these complex math puzzles and verification by many computers ensures that we can trust each and every block on the chain. Because the network does the trust building for us, we now have the opportunity to interact directly with our data in real time. And that brings us to the third reason blockchain technology is such a game changer. No more intermediaries. 
Currently, when doing business with one another, we don't show the other person our financial or business records. Instead, we rely on trusted intermediaries, such as a bank or lawyer, to view our records and keep that information confidential. These intermediaries build trust between the parties and are able to verify, for example, that yes, Anne is the rightful owner of this land. This approach limits exposure and risk, but also adds another step to the exchange, which means more time and money spent. If Anne's land title information was stored in a blockchain, she could cut out the middleman, her lawyer, who would ordinarily confirm her information with Steve. As we now know, all blocks added to the chain have been verified to be true and can't be tampered with, so Anne can simply show Steve her land title information secured on the blockchain. Anne would save considerable time and money by cutting out the middleman. This type of trusted peer-to-peer -peer interaction with our data can revolutionize the way we access, verify, and transact with one another. And because blockchain is a type of technology and not a single network, it can be implemented in many different ways. Some blockchains can be completely public and open to everyone to view and access. Others can be closed to a select group of authorized users, such as your company, a group of banks, or government agencies. And there are hybrid public-private blockchains too. In some, those with private access can see all the data, while the public can see only selections. In others, everyone can see all the data, but only some people have access to add new data. A government, for example, could use a hybrid system to record the boundaries of Anne's property and the fact that she owns it while keeping her personal information private. Or it could allow everyone to view property records but reserve to itself the exclusive right to update them. It is the combination of all these factors, decentralizing of the data, building trust in the data, and allowing us to interact directly with one another and the data that gives blockchain technology the potential to underpin many of the ways we interact with one another. But, much like the rise of the internet, this technology will bring with it all kinds of complex policy questions around governance, international law, security, and economics. Here at the Centre for International Governance Innovation, we seek to bring trusted research that will equip policymakers with the information Okay, so welcome again. My name is Nicole Anand. I'm the Director of Strategy and Learning at the Engine Room, and I have with me four excellent panelists doing some very interesting work on digital ledger technologies. Um, I'll start all the way at the end with Marco. So we have Marco Konopaki, right? Um, and Marco is currently pursuing a doctorate degree in political science at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, and he holds a master's degree from the Federal University, University of Paraná in political science. He was an advisor in the Secretary of the Legislative Affairs of um, uh, the Ministry of Justice, where he coordinated the public debate on the regulation of Brazil's Internet Bill of Rights. And he is currently the project coordinator in the area of democracy and technology at the Institute of Technology and Society of Rio, um, where he's created the Mudamos app that we'll hear about later for citizens initiative draft bills in, in Brazil. Um, next to him, we have Anders Peterson. And Anders is, um, Anders is a senior open data officer at the Natural Resource Governance Institute, NRGI, where he leads work on open data and emerging areas, including net research NRGI is undertaking on the potential impact of blockchain in the extractive sector, which we'll also hear about a little, in a little bit. Um, next to Anders, we have Andrew, Andrew Young. Andrew is the knowledge director at the GovLab, where he leads research efforts focusing on the impact of technology on public institutions. Among the grant-funded projects he has directed are a global assessment of the impact of open government data, comparative benchmarking of government innovation efforts against those um, of other countries, a methodology for leveraging corporate data to benefit the public good, and crafting the experimental design for the testing 
for testing the adoption of technology innovations in federal agencies. And last but not least, we have Stefan Verhost. Um, Stefan is the co-founder and chief research and development officer at the Gov, Gov Lab as well, where he's building a research foundation on how to transform governance using advances in science and technology. Stefan leads several projects at the Gov Lab, including research on open data, data collaboratives, blockchain technologies, and people-led innovation. Previously, he held senior leadership roles with several academic institutions and civil society organizations, including Oxford University and the Markle Foundation. And Stefan has authored and co-authored numerous books, and his articles have appeared in the Harvard Business Review and Stanford Social Innovation Review. Finally, Stefan is also a curator and editor of the GovLab Digest, a weekly curation that may be of interest to this community. Great. So, we, um, we have about 60 minutes together, and I'm going to start us off with a tiny, a very quick intro. Then I'm going to be asking one round of the same question to each of the panelists. They'll have, it will be a rapid fire round. They'll have a minute to respond. Then I'll ask each panelist a separate question. They will each have about 10 minutes to um, uh, present, present back to us. And then we'll wrap it up with one last rapid fire round. They'll have a minute to answer that question. And then we'll try to reserve 20 minutes for Q&A. Sound good? Yeah, OK, good. So um, let's get started. The video you just watched presented hopefully some clear and digestible information about blockchain technologies, but it also included a lot of the potential advantages to using it. I think there was a lot of use of the potential, revolutionize. So, um, you know, it, it presented a lot of kind of the positive side. Um, but we are here today to talk both about the potential opportunities as well as the risks or the challenges um, that may come with using blockchain, particularly in, in the civic tech world. So I'm just going to very quickly introduce one framework to help us think through the risk side of, of the equation. And let me just put up one slide. So there are many things that we don't quite know about blockchain, but one thing I think many people can agree on is that it's popular and it's gaining popularity. So what does that actually mean for us? Again, we're not sure there are maybe clear answers to that question, but one framework that has definitely been useful for analyzing popular technologies or hyped tech is this hype cycle, which I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with. But essentially what it shows us is that um, where we start, uh, it shows us that there's a cost of hype tech to society, right? And where we start, um, where it starts is really to say, we think, we think this technology is the silver bullet and we overinvest in it and then we realize that it really isn't the end-all be-all or the cure-all and we we fall out of love with it we run away from it um, but slowly slowly but surely over time we realize there are certain aspects to this technology that might be useful in certain contexts with certain stakeholders um, so at this point in time we know we know that um, blockchain has been considered in other sectors and has been used. We have some anecdotes about it being used in our world in civic technology and we're, we'll hear more about that today. Um, but, but to avoid costly decisions and also take advantage of the potential opportunities, we want to know and what we're going to discuss here today is if we should be considering this potentially high technology, when and how. Yeah. So. That's basically the question we're going to start with, which is, should we be considering blockchain technologies in our civic technology work? Why or why not? And I'm going to hand it over to the panelists, and maybe we start at that end with 
with Marco. Um, yeah, just very quick, 60 seconds. I think I don't have my mic on. Oh, push the, if you push the mic. The other one next to huh? Or try Anders, maybe. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And good morning, people. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you in this wonderful morning. Um, so it's a big, big, hard question, but I try to, to put in, in two basic questions to, uh, to provoke the audience about it. I think the big mistake many organizations are doing uh, nowadays is to put technology first when we, they are designing social and civic solutions. And the blockchain is not different. Uh, blockchain is in every moment of our life, and people are speaking so much about there. Um, for me, two blocks in my coffee, if, if it's possible. Uh, so to try to, to frame the uh, more specific, how, what, where, when is it important to use blockchain? I, I give you two questions to do to, your, to yourself. Um, is keeping information with one player could unbalance in power and generate mistrust between participants in the system? Um, share the power between participants can make it more reliable. Um, so, these two questions. Thanks, Marco. Um, my, my rapid answer would be that uh, one reason why we need to deal with it is that the private sector is investing immensely in it. So in many of the sectors where we work, we will not be able to avoid it in the future. Um, there will be a, a cycle of overinvestment, but we also actually see quite rapidly that industry is clustering around commercially viable areas. Um, so we need to understand that. And then obviously we need to un unpack what are political problems and social problems and which parts and what are technical solutions that can maybe help address some of these. Um, but really doing our, our analysis and getting back to our theories of change and understanding what problems we're dealing with will help us sift through all the noise. And there is a lot of noise right now. And, uh, and our ability to ask the questions now will help us uh, avoid a very hard landing in a few years from now. And that's both for us as a community, it's also for the donors that are putting in money towards this right now. <laughs> All right, thank you. So uh, my 60 seconds, uh, I think, yes, the civic tech field should be considering the use of blockchain. I think it's important and something that we're going to talk about in a moment to take a more nuanced approach, though, and consider the different attributes that different types of DLT implementations might have, the different risks and benefits associated with different types of uh, blockchain implementations, and be a little bit, again, more nuanced and strategic about how we consider using blockchain rather than just going back to all of the blog posts and uh, research proposals that we wrote five years ago and replacing Uber for X with blockchain for X. Yeah, I don't have that much to add here and we will of course go into depth uh, uh, during our presentation, but I think one thing that I think is positive about the hype, and of course, anyway, as you mentioned, the hype might become a bust as well, and that's the danger. But I think one thing that is positive about the hype of blockchain right now is that it has actually unleashed a lot of energy to think about a problem differently. And it has really created this new kind of uh, uh, energy to look at a problem and say, perhaps we can find a different solution, whether it's around uh, protection of data, whether it's around uh, power relations with regard to certain kinds of records, uh, whether it's about even uh, um, direct democracy, is that suddenly the blockchain has actually unleashed new power, uh, new um, uh, imaginative discussions about what could we do differently. 
And I think that's actually a, a, a positive element of the blockchain discussions. Uh, whether, of course, blockchain can deliver, that's a different question. But I think the hype has really created new discussions and brought actually new actors to the discussion that I think is positive. And so that for that reason, we should use blockchain not just for technology adoption, but use blockchain as a way to force us to think differently about the problem and differently about how society is organized. Great, thank you all. So building off of that last um, comment, uh, Stefan, Andrew, I think this, these questions are for both of you because you'll be presenting together, right? So two questions. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how and when the civic tech community should be considering blockchain in, in their work, so this audience? Um, are there certain applications that seem more useful? Um, it, it, the second question is, at the GovLab, I know you guys are, are talking a lot about when an ecosystem is ready for a new technology. So can you share with us a little bit about what you mean, what, what ecosystem readiness really means when it comes to the application of blockchain technologies? Great. So this is such a big question that we're going to back a team uh, to answer that question. And, uh, uh, we prepared a little to uh, answer those questions. Um, and so, um, what we will um, tag team about is to try to answer that question in the context of a uh, project that we started uh, a, a few months ago, so we are actually still uh, early in the project, uh, which is called Blockchain. Uh, because it's about uh, blockchain for social change. And, uh, and we thought that uh, given the fact that uh, the, anyway, we're quite happy about the title. Oops. <laughs> that, uh, that perhaps from now on, it uh, can only go downhill because uh, if you have a catchy title, then uh, the expectations are too high. So that's why I need Andrew to help me out to actually uh, explain what we are talking about. So what we try to do here is exactly uh, what Nicole asked us, which is, when is it appropriate to think about blockchain for social change? And what is the current practice? Because to a large extent, as the introduction already showed, there is a lot of promise. Uh, so what is the real practice? And what is the gap between practice and promise? And how do you go about uh, covering that gap if deemed to be appropriate? Now, important to say is that while we got this um, uh, introduction through the, uh, the video, which gave us a, a flavor of what blockchain is all about and what the technology is all about, I think it's important to say is that while we are in the high space, we are also actually really at the early stage of development. And uh, this is just uh, one, you know, we have many of those uh, uh, slides. Uh, actually, the interesting one that I found was about startup scene in Luxembourg, which was like you know, gigantic, which is you know, surprising uh, around fintech and uh, the, uh, the blockchain environment. But I think the big message here is that the technology is not set yet. Uh, and that there are a huge amount of investments both in the infrastructure but also in the application. And that as a result, we really don't have one kind of technology. We have a, a variety of technologies. And so what we try to do is not talk about blockchain technologies or DLT as being the set uh, uh, infrastructure, but really talk about what are the attributes that matter from a social change point of view. Right, and so this is where we take a little bit of issue with, with what was in the video. Um, this really in looking at this more nuanced view of blockchain and DLTs, what we find is that the narratives around blockchain often includes both the guaranteed attributes that are found in basically all blockchain implementations, as well as some more optional attributes that could be serviced or could not be depending on the approach. So in the guaranteed attribute space, we see you know, a level of immutability, some confidence that the data is going to remain, uh, the, block, the data in the block is going to remain immutable over time. A, a level of guaranteed integrity that the quality of the information found on the blockchain is going to, again, remain high quality over time. And then also a level of distributed resilience where the information is held across many databases that are uh, duplicated in many places so that uh, data breach or a hacking approach is a bit more difficult because of that distributed resilience approach. 
But again, looking at some of the narratives around blockchain, you often see these more optional, optional uh, uh, attributes included in that discussion. So you know, if we look at the different types of blockchains, including something like a private permission blockchain, uh, essentially where all of the nodes exist within one or two institutions, and only certain actors have write access, and only certain actors have read access, it's hard to talk about attributes around disintermediation or transparency or accessibility. So while those could be present in certain applications, they aren't always there. It's important to recognize that these are optional attributes. Yeah. And uh, so the question then is, of course, given that we know what those attributes might be, um, what are the types of applications that blockchain could provide to the civic change kind of community. And frankly, there are three large types of uh, 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 kinds of uh, use cases that we see. Uh, the first ones are track and trace, where you exactly can track and trace over time the flow of the uh, record and uh, the, uh, in, some, in some cases, even the record that is connected with an identity. The second one is smart contracting, and then the third <coughs> one is around identity. And so in the track and trace space, probably the paradigmatic example um, to date is this initiative where the purity and provenance of diamonds is being tracked over the blockchain to ensure that you know, the diamond that you buy in a ring at the local jewelry store isn't contributing to conflict areas or course plate. As it relates to smart contracting, which in essence is basically uh, just a kind of an algorithm, if X then Y, okay, that's basically the concept of smart contracting. So if you actually have a record that automatically there's an action, an automated action connected with the record, so if the record is added to the blockchain, then there is an automated action. So in this case, it was an interesting experiment that is happening in Indonesia, which uh, indicates that if the, uh, uh, a community can prove that they didn't um, put their uh, agricultural uh, farmland on fire, which is a typical method of actually clearing certain kinds of uh, crops, uh, they would be re uh, rewarded uh, a, uh, a uh, monetary price that they can then decide to invest in, whether it's in schooling or whether it's in healthcare, for instance. And so that was an interesting experiment of smart contracting, because normally A, it would take a long time to validate that certain action, in this case, did not take place, and B, it would then take time to actually reward the action. And so in this case, it was smart contracting where the moment a record was established and verified, there was automatically a, uh, a reward in this context. And then the last type of blockchain or civic change type of initiative that we've been looking at is around identity. And this is the, the, uh, the type of use case that we're especially focused on at the moment in Jobla. And one interesting example there, and we'll talk about it more in a moment, um, is this uh, pilot project from Illinois where new births were being registered on a blockchain, testing the feasibility of that kind of approach to have an immutable ledger of new births in the state. So we decided that uh, of all the three uh, use cases, track and trace, smart contracting, identity, that identity really for this field is the foundational application that we should start looking at. And it also provides for a lot of promise from a social change point of view, because identity has ultimately a key role in social change, because to a large extent it allows for access to certain kinds of services, right? For instance, if you have no identity, you cannot access quite financial services, or you cannot access uh, certain kinds of commercial services. But it also, identity is also linked to rights. Uh, without an identity, it's very hard to implement even political rights, for instance, like voting, which is why uh, blockchain is quite often connected with actually improvement in voting because it can deal with actually providing for a trusted identity over time that allows for more direct voting and more regular voting, for instance, as well. The second uh, reason why we believe that identity is very important for this community to, uh, to look into is because it underpins both smarter contracting and the track and trace. Uh, uh, without quite often your identity, it's not very hard to do track and trace. And here we're not talking just about identity of individuals. It could also be identity, for instance, of a diamond or identity uh, of a uh, corporation, for instance. And that ultimately allows for them the uh, identification 
uh, uh, both in the tracking and the trace of certain kinds of um, aspects. And then thirdly, and that's where there's a lot of narrative these days uh, around blockchain, identity is being, or the blockchain is being seen as allowing for um, the missing protocol to be established. There's a lot of talk about Web 3.0, uh, in which uh, uh, they point that actually in the previous web versions uh, they missed one important protocol that actually led to the creation of Facebook and other identity owners and that was actually the protocol to identify identity. I mean, absent that uh, 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 being able to identify identity without uh, uh, relying on an intermediary um, that has actually created all the business models behind certain kinds of services that we see. And so there's a lot of narrative that if blockchain could solve this, we would actually create a whole new ecosystem, a distributed ecosystem, as if the web was intended to be. And so that's the uh, other reason why we try to understand what actually is the, uh, uh, the case with regard to identity. Right. And then, so, just as blockchain, uh, blockchain technologies are not a monolith, identity is not a monolith. So, to get a little bit more strategic about the potential of blockchain uh, in the identity space, we're really focused on the identity life cycle and the different problems that are particularly present at different stages and the potential uh, attributes of blockchain that could potentially address those problems at those different stages. So I'm just going to go through these real quickly because I know that we're running a little bit short on time. But at the first stage of provisioning, you know, the, the issue around lack of identity, you often hear the, the discussion around, is blockchain an approach to address the 1.1 billion that currently lack official identities um, around the world? So the idea that universal access could be uh, created through the blockchain. At the authentication stage, you know, the, the lack of quality and trusted identifiers um, is often uh, found at both the foundational ID and the transactional ID level, and does the integrity that blockchain initiatives can provide, does that um, uh, show a way forward there? At the administration stage, you know, the lack of agency that we often see where I have no control over different identifiers and how to me who can access and who can view them. Can a blockchain approach actually give me more user control over my identity and different elements, uh, identifiers associated with me? At the authorization stage, fragmentation of requirements. I, I recently uh, had a new debit card sent to me that got lost in the mail. I went to the bank, showed them my New York City ID and a credit card uh, provided to me by the same bank, and they said, oh, these don't work. Do you have a passport with you? Obviously, a minor issue in the grand scheme of things, but those fragmentation requirements, you can imagine how they could be a, a major issue in a more um, important area. So can blockchain provide some kind of interoperability of different ID approaches? And then finally, at the auditing and monitoring stage, you know, we often have that opacity of who is, again, who is looking at my information. Uh, the identity as a black box issue can, again, certain types of blockchain initiatives that are focused on surfacing the transparency act, um, aspect actually address that challenge. Yeah, and so that's what we uh, was set out to do. And so we are currently looking into a variety of practices that try to deal with some aspect of the identity lifestyle. Because I think it's important to uh, really become more granular if we talk about blockchain, about what element of the life cycle do they really try to address. And so for instance, on the provisioning stage, we have something called ID2020 that was created last year, which really tries to, or has the narrative to bring on the 1.1 billion uh, people that cannot identify themselves at the moment, to bring them uh, on an identity system. And it turns out that provisioning is actually, the blockchain is not the right, probably not the right technology for provisioning in the first place. That actually, in order to get an identity, a record, you actually need other technologies quite often to get on the blockchain, such as biometrics or other kinds of uh, tools. And so the, the whole narrative about blockchain can create identity where there is no identity turns out to be uh, low in maturity, as we say. Um, uh, <laughs> do you want to do your presentation? Uh, sure. So at the authentication stage, um, we're looking at especially another one of those paradigmatic examples um, of current practice, the World Food Program's Building Blocks Initiative, which is actually one of the more mature, um, specific implementations, but there's a lot of issues around it that we're looking at. 
including the different benefits of blockchain and how they play off each other. So the authentication uh, protocol for the World Food Program Initiative is using biometric data as in scanning of irises to confirm and authenticate identity. So while that leads to a high level of efficiency, there are some questions around what that effect is on dignity. So while there is a, a, a maturity of the technological implementation, there are still some uh, bigger questions. Yeah, and the real, um, um, the real value proposition quite often as it relates to identity and blockchain is then uh, related to administration, right? If only we could give power to the individual to control his or her data and then negotiate with uh, all the actors in the ecosystem on how and what they want to disclose, then life would be so much better. And so um, that's what the, the whole range of technologies and startups around self-sovereign identity try to do. And so here, we again have explored a variety of uh, initiatives, and one uh, famous one that uh, most uh, uh, refer to is the initiative of uh, Zouk, uh, which is a, uh, a town in Switzerland, where they try to actually experiment with self-sovereign identity for their citizens. Now, the challenge here is again, how do you get the self-sovereign identity? And actually, in this case, it actually really also still means that you have to go to the city hall in person to re request an identity. And then, ultimately, the question is, what do you do with uh, uh, the self-sovereign identity? The challenge with self-sovereign identity, while promising, and I don't want to be too critical, the challenge is, um, if you have no ecosystem that accepts the self-sovereign identity, then you have no transactions. And so at the moment, the ecosystem is clearly not ready for self-sovereign identity because there is no uh, uh, parties that accept your self-sovereign identity. And so most of the cases that we see are like a scale of 50 individuals that have a self-sovereign identity like in Zoo, and then try to figure out how can we start sharing this with actually the real world. Uh, and it turns out that it might be harder. Now, yeah, I could go on. <laughs> so, uh, a similar issue around ecosystems, you know, to Nicole's earlier question, is present at the authorization stage. So, one project that we're looking at right now is MIT's Digital Diploma Project, which is uh, essentially a blockchain initiative for transcripts and uh, your diploma from MIT. The project works fantastically. The people who accept it can use it well. Uh, there's a level of user control and can access things. But again, is the ecosystem ready where if I get offered a new job, I can send my blockchain diploma? Um, that's a big question still. Yeah, and on the auditing and monitoring here, we of course have a, a range of interesting initiatives around land registries, and I think uh, Anders might talk about that as well. So I'm not going to go through it into detail, but that's really, turns out, one of the uh, interesting and more successful areas where the blockchain has been uh, uh, experimented with. The key challenge here, of course, is already uh, what's the legacy system of land registries? And it turns out, like for instance, in the case of Sweden, they actually did have a good uh, land registry uh, uh, system, and so it was easier to actually transfer the registry to a blockchain. In the case where there is no land registry or, or trustworthy land registry system, it is still harder to then have blockchain as the uh, solution, which again is linked with actually the, the provisioning. So the question that we then posed is, when, as a uh, civic change community, when is it actually appropriate to start thinking about blockchain? Because we are in a lot of discussions with actually civic, uh, uh, civil society organizations about, let's do blockchain. And the question is, when is it actually appropriate to do blockchain? So we really focus on three types of categories of uh, enabling operational conditions. And the first is around the problem. So again, going back to the Uber for X, uh, for a blockchain initiative to really uh, have potential in the identity space, there needs to be a clear problem definition and an understanding of how different blockchain attributes could address that problem. A second one is around information asymmetries and high levels of transaction costs in the current system, if that can help to incentivize change. And for the economists in the room, we often point to the market of lemons uh, paper, and the, which is focused on information asymmetries in the purchasing of used cars. Um, so whenever there is a high level of, um, in, in the current system, if there isn't the type of quality of information across all of the actors, that could be a good, um, a, a good situation in which to implement a blockchain project. 
then on the data and technology side, um, as Stefan said, the, the presence of digital records can be uh, uh, give a great head start to a blockchain initiative. Um, also, really importantly, again, not looking to have blockchain be the hammer always in search of a nail. If there's already a, a credible and alternative disclosure technology being used in the space, blockchain might not really be all that necessary. And then finally, again, to the ecosystem question, um, the presence of intermediaries uh, can be a big uh, determiner, uh, determinant of the uh, effectiveness of a blockchain initiative, whether it's uh, strong and efficient intermediaries that can be leveraged as partners in initiative, or largely deficient and ineffective intermediaries that can incentivize a new and more decentralized approach. And besides those uh, operational conditions, when is it appropriate to think blockchain? We also feel that the field needs to, uh, from day one, uh, start developing a set of design principles. And so here is our attempt to uh, give a, uh, a range of design principles under the term Be Guarded, uh, in which G stands for, actually it's very important to have a legitimate governance structure governing the blockchain. And I think that should be a first principle if you uh, engage on blockchain technology. Second is that you should also assure a certain level of user accessibility and of course user friendliness and it turns out by the way that most blockchain initiatives right now score kind of low on user friendliness and user accessibility and so that as a civic change uh, community this should be one principle third principle is that you really want to uh, adopt a certain agency of participation uh, we gave the examples for instance of the world food program where they developed blockchain to establish identity, but there was little agency of participation by the refugees, meaning the refugees had frankly no choice except for to accept biometric technology if they wanted to uh, 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 benefit from the services provided. So what's the agency of participation on a blockchain system is very important. And the same thing, but then of course, is that a lot of this discussion as all the technologies in the space is very vendor driven. And so we also need to make sure that there is no vendor lock-in. Rights-based approach uh, uh, is uh, similarly a design principle. Dignity of establishing a record. Uh, again, the example of the World Food Program. What is the dignity of actually having a record on uh, the uh, the blockchain? Ecological footprint. There was a lot of, we haven't discussed that yet. There was a lot of discussion about how do you establish proof. And uh, of course, if you use a uh, coin system, uh, uh, turns out a coin system can actually create a huge carbon footprint. And so if you are a civic tech community and you care about the uh, environment, then block and you use a coin system, environment might actually be harmed as a result of what you're trying to do. And so you need to also think about what's the ecological footprint of adopting a uh, blockchain. And then last but not least, of course, many of those examples that we've given uh, or have given, um, and there are many more, uh, are experimenting uh, in situations where there are vulnerable populations and quite often have no agency to reject blockchain as a solution. And so we really have to think about, anyway, if you are using those experiments, uh, try to also do no harm during the experimentation phase of using blockchain to those vulnerable populations. And so that's why we feel you should be guarded uh, when uh, developing blockchain technologies. And with that, Nicole. We probably went over time. All right, okay. Thanks so much. Um, really interesting information. Uh, to the three use cases, to all of the frameworks thereafter. Um, I especially liked the title and the acronym, but um, those were my favorites. So moving on, Anders, um, at NRGI recently, you've decided to explore the potential of DLTs with work um, on extractives. So can you tell us a little bit why you've made that decision and what you hope it will result in? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll try to be, to be quick so that we can get to, uh, get to questions and discussions as well. Um, so at, at NRGI, we work on um, extractive transparency, uh, and that means what are mining and oil companies doing anywhere from when they start exploring to the taxes they pay to 
uh, how does uh, what is the environmental impact? So we really look at a, at a number of different things. Like this will look like a lot of sort of frameworks that you will see in sort of any kind of sector, uh, wash, uh, any other. But it's ma mainly just to say that I think there's a huge potential for sector-driven organizations in understanding how this can be applied because knowing, having topical knowledge and understanding problems in a specific area gives you, it's much easier to understand problems and then pick and choose blockchain than this understanding blockchain and then going and finding your problem. And that is a lot of the sort of, a lot of the discussion in the community is right now ha happening around this. And uh, that, that's what I've called the, the implementation dessert. But um, what we really have is, is a desert in terms of actual use cases. What is happening? What are the results? And the, the reason for that is really that we have uh, seven white papers going out each week from startups, and they are in a pitching mode, and they will pitch basically until they run, they run out of money uh, or need to go and find another job. And that means that we really don't have a lot of material. So the research right now is very much based on interviews, is based on some of the documentation that's starting coming out. And I would encourage people who are interested in this in reading some of the really good skeptical pieces around this that really takes a hard look of um, like the lack of uptake of blockchain, if you take the hard look over the last 10 years, have been very minimal. Uh, it's still incredibly costly uh, to run tokens. It's still, the, the use cases are very, are, are still very niche. Um, but what I found maybe even more, what I find maybe even more interesting is uh, all the gray area implementations. And we'll start to see much more of that. Um, one that struck me was uh, what the, was the refugee camp program in Jordan, where uh, a, a recent review of it said in a sort of a insert sentence that this was all great for cost reductions. Um, we just at some point found out that it was a little too expensive to run it on token, so we ended up just doing it on our own database. So that means like you've reduced costs, and that's why you went into it. And then you found out, okay, it's actually really, it's, we can't meet our cost reductions, so let's cut out transparency. Um, and transparency was your pitch. So this comes back to some of the, th I've been in the open data movement for five or 10 years. There we've had a lot of challenges of really defining accurately what is open, what is not open. And we will have the same with blockchain. We will need to be very clear in, does this add on transparency or, or accountability, or is this a cost-cutting exercise? Because there's just no doubt, and to the skeptics, we can just say there's no doubt that there are commercial use cases out there for driving this. The language of cutting out the middleman will be, is very powerful. Um, I mean, there's been a 10, 20 year, for 10, 20 years, economists have wondered, how do we eliminate the notary pr profession? And this may be their chance. <laughs> um, but before that, there's been all kinds of other attempts to make, uh, make that profession and make the manual review of uh, legal agreements, et cetera, to, to challenge that. So there are really economics behind this. Um, so I want to talk about two, two cases where we are currently exploring it. This is, we're very early in our research stage. We're working actually in full disclosure with GovLab to, to understand this space. Um, and at this stage, we're like looking at, at some, some different cases. Um, mining licensing is a really good example of something where a technology, the core technology of understanding land titles and of enabling blockchain technologies in land titling, where the extractive sector may actually end up benefiting from technologies developed in, in, in other areas that can then spill into, into, uh, into mining. Um, I'm not sure why it's doing this. Um, and just to take an example of a real problem we have, um, Indonesia has uh, thousands of, of land titles where multiple jurisdictions will award the same 
uh, land for various use. So you have a mine where a provincial government has awarded that mining license, maybe another uh, agency has awarded it for forestry, and at the same time you may have communal land claims on that same land. So this is not a technical challenge, this is a, challenge, a political problem where there are multiple political jurisdictions that are probably all legal and allowed and mandated to award this, these licenses. So what Indonesia has tried over the last 10 years is to have one map policy where they bring all of this together in one database with one ministry. And guess how much public information we have about settled disputes from that central core ministry. I mean, the, the one map policy is an example of the solution of taking one database and centralize all decisions in one ministry. That may not be the only solution out there. And thinking about verification from multiple parties and having a more open verification system where, uh, where disputed claims can be made public is probably something that's worth exploring. Um, another thing, another area that, that we have our eyes on is, uh, is commodity trading. So right now, one of the most secretive areas of, uh, of the oil sector is the sale between uh, between Swiss commodity traders, for example, and, uh, and national oil companies. So uh, the government of Chad, they run a, a national oil company. They sell some of their oils through Swiss commodity traders, and we can't really find out where, where the money is going. Now, at the same time, we can see that commodity traders are very excited about blockchain. Why are they excited about that? Because they would like in New York to know if that trade that is coming in and that is in a PDF, that that is actually oil from Iraq or Chad and that it's not oil from somewhere else because they need to sell that, resell that, and they need to reduce their risks. So for, for commodity traders, this is a real value proposition. If they can reduce risks on a lot of their trades, they can, there's a higher margin and, uh, and they can also uh, focus their risk more appropriate to a smaller number of trades. So what I could imagine, what we're imagining could happen in the future is that we may end up with the same countries that we know are in risk, for example, under SWIFT or under financial transactions, that those will be de-risked and have a more accurate risk proposition ass assessed to them. So there's a lot of things here that shows us that there's definitely a private market for that. The questions for us is, how do we as accountability actors ensure that there are disclosure mechanisms built into this? That we're thinking about how can some of this information be made public? Because if we don't engage, this train is just gonna go. Um, so, so that's sort of, that's, that's also an, an argument for saying we don't necessarily need to do blockchain as civil society, but we need to understand how it's implemented because the next disclosure wave or the more granular data, the more timely data, if we don't want three-year-old PDFs, we should probably try to understand how we can ask questions about how this can be disclosed through security exchanges or through other mechanisms. And that's all. Thanks, Anders, for those sector-specific examples. Um, this, this has been great because we've set kind of the scene. We've talked about it at a broad level. We've talked about the ecosystem. We've moved on to a specific sector. And we're going to end it on, uh, with a specific example of application. So Marco, you've been working on a project called Mudamos. Um, can you tell us a bit about the project, why you decided to use blockchain in this project, and um, what you've learned thus far? Good morning, everyone. What's that? Yes. Um, so 
I split my presentation in three parts. Like uh, the first one, what is Mudamus? And after that, why we use it blockchain? And how blockchain? Uh, to explain uh, how we use it blockchain in this project. Um, Brazil, uh, all Brazilian citizens have the, the right to present to the Congress uh, citizens initiatives draft bills, uh, which are presented and, and legitimate by gathering uh, signatures from uh, the Brazilian society. Uh, for a national bill to be presented for the Congress, uh, are needed more than one point one and a half million of signatures uh, to present a bill to the National Congress. It corresponds to uh, almost 2,000 kilograms of paper uh, to in signatures. So we design an application to use in a creative way technology to substitute the way to present uh, draft bills signed by paper to turn the smartphones into digital pens to sign. Um, I think better. Yes. Um, we we create mudamos to turn smartphones into digital pens to 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 sign citizens um, draft bills and so on, uh, eliminating paper to propose the initiative bills. And we we did it in the very kind of simple hello hello, <laughs> and a very kind of simple way we. When we created Mudamus, Mudamus, uh, when people download Mudamus from the application store, they register, and once they are registered, uh, they had a, the, the Mudamus created a private key uh, that is only uh, had, uh, contained in the smartphone of the users. So with this private key, they can sign draft bills disposing uh, that are disposed uh, in the application to sign. And weekly, uh, Mudamus generates the list of the signed signatures and make a stamp to get the process, the entire process of gathering uh, signatures trackable and traceable. I put it in, in, in a general case what is Mudamus, um, but uh, why we use blockchain? Uh, can't we do the same thing uh, just may, uh, making, uh, making uh, an application that uh, organize those signatures and uh, make the support viewable by the, the whole citizenship uh, like uh, Avas do or, or does, or like change.org does? That's the question. Um, Brazilian institutions had a bad reputation, and people perceived them as unreliable. It's worse when we talk about polit political institutions. Um, Signature campaigns running by organizations, uh, due to, do, uh, uh, these signature campaigns, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning signature campaigns to, to gathering sig signatures from, from the, the citizenship, uh, are centralized by uh, organizations. And it's hard to people rely on organization when you have low levels of trust in the society. So uh, sharing is caring unless if it's a standard. Um, what we do uh, and we made with Mudamus is creating a system that uh, the way we sign uh, or the way the people sign for uh, those draft bills are shared uh, and everyone can check 
uh, the signatures made by 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 the civilians and uh, the, the citizenship and any campaign coordinator or any public institution or any citizen uh, can have the same condition to 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 signature checking and and have the all, all, the whole accountability of the campaign in, in their hands uh, we have we have built a system of shared trust where the signature generated by users is an asset which can be verified by anyone who cares about this asset. It is an important thing. Um, we treat uh, the signature generated by Mudamos as an asset. So uh, people who cares about uh, the, the, the campaign uh, gathering uh, signatures uh, cares, care uh, it as an asset. And it's an important asset when they reach the, the, the amount, the minimum amount of signatures, uh, these have a political value because they can present draft bills to the, to the, to the legislative houses. So how blockchain? How we made this, this way to, to get this, uh, this way to share uh, trust about the signatures collected, uh, gathered by, uh, get collected by Mudamus. Can you uh, uh, warn me when rest, one minute to rest? Yes, thank you. Um, with we, uh, how blockchain, with Mudamus we thought blockchain beyond the block. It's one, one, one thing I, I, I like to say. Um, Blockchain is not an unequivocal technology. It's 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 good to to think, and and good to say. Uh, many people um, think blockchain is like a, a, a something that it's like a, a block, <laughs> and an unequivocal uh, block, and there is uh, just one way to to see it. But blockchain is more than than uh, a block. Blockchain is uh, composed by uh, many uh, different pieces of technologies, small technologies that made blockchain possible, like uh, communication protocols, uh, uh, crypto, uh, cryptographic technologies. So uh, it's important to, to, to decompose what blockchain uh, is. And for instance, in Mudamus, we use blockchain just in one of the part of this uh, uh, authentication uh, and tracking track in track of the process. When people sign in 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 Mudamus, we have a process of hashing of the, that signature, and we had a small piece of data that uh, is necessary to present a draft uh, bill to the Congress. So it's, it's a legal uh, uh, concern about what data we, we, we put and, and, and is signed. So when people uh, sign for a draft bill, they have the, some personal data, data and they hash uh, the, this, this data with uh, their uh, private keys inside their smartphones. So we have a signature that is verifiable by the public key generate, generated when people uh, had registered for Mudamus. So th this is the same technology uh, blockchain uses to sign messages when people broadcast messages uh, with like Bitcoin transactions. Uh, all the, the messages generated for the, for the network are, are signed uh, f by the people's wallet. Uh, so we did the same uh, technique to, uh, to, the public, uh, to the citizenship signatures. And it works very, very, uh, in a very, very interesting way. Weekly, we gather and, and, and combine all those signatures in PDFs um, documents that these documents uh, are signed and, and registered, stamped uh, in a blockchain, in a public blockchain, 
and uh, Mudamos to the, uh, nowadays uses uh, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchain. So these documents can uh, make uh, can uh, demonstrate to the public and to the to the citizenship uh, the the track the how trackable this process of gathering signatures uh, is being done. Um, it's important to uh, make it this process auditable. So uh, anyone who participating in gathering signatures for uh, initiative draft bills, uh, citizens initiative draft bills, can check uh, how the process of uh, col signature collection collecting is is being done. Uh, one minute. Yes, I'm. I'm just yeah, finished. So what we we have learned uh, with Mudamus, uh, Mudamus was launched in March of 2017. So we are we are running Mudamus for a year, and we, what we the lessons, what good we 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 learned uh, was uh, think blockchain beyond the unitary technolo technology and take advantage of a small technology piece of blockchain. It was one of the good things. And, in, uh, and particularly, we now are trying and thinking Mudamus as a wallet and, and testing some uh, identity experiments. So it's interesting. One of the small pieces of technology we can uh, prove and test uh, beyond the blockchain, the, the entire or the whole blockchain. But the bad uh, was overcome blockchain literacy. Uh, even we have made a system where anyone can check signatures by themselves, just a few people know to do it. Even we have created a trustless, trustful system, people still rely on ITS instead in the system. So ITS plays a, 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 a hole in this uh, process. And we created, we have created a system to um, make the system independent of ITS. But uh, until now, because this block, the, the the lack of blockchain literacy, ITS still plays a whole of this, and it was of the, one of the bad things we we have learned in this process. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marco, for sharing. In the interest of time, we're going to cut the last question um, out, but uh, open it up to you guys um, to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. You right in front. No, Mike? Okay. Um, I, I would actually, um, it's a two-part question. The first part goes to Marco. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, thank you for the presentation. What you're doing is, is very cool, not just because we're doing a similar thing in, in, uh, in Estonia. Um, I'm wondering how you get around this, the, the Mickey Mouse problem. So if I buy a prepaid SIM card uh, in Brazil uh, and register for Mudamos and identify myself as Mickey Mouse, how does Mudamos know that I'm not indeed Mickey Mouse? Uh, and how do they know that I'm a Brazilian citizen allowed to petition the national parliament? And the second part then goes to, I guess, Stefan or, or, or any of you is, is about Mudamos doesn't have this problem because they're, they're in, in Brazil, but with servers in Ireland, we have the GDPR problem. So Mickey Mouse has certain rights starting May 25th in the European Union. One of those rights is the right to be forgotten. Um, if you, know, you, you can't exercise this right to the government, you can't say to the government that forget my birth certificate. But, but you can exercise this right in, in respect to a, a, a civic organization and you can say, you know, forget everything that I've ever commented or voted on in your system. That doesn't work with, with blockchain. You can't, like, blockchain doesn't allow data to die. It's a philosophical issue that's interesting, but, but it's a very practical issue that I, like, I have to forget my numbers if they so require. So how do you, do you see any, any developments going on around the GDPR compliance and blockchain? And so, sorry, long question. Um, we, Marco, yes, yeah. yeah. 
Nice. Uh, we address this. The, uh, this is a, a good question, and we address this question in two ways to think uh, about um, how to overcome this um, mistrust about who signs and Mickey, if Mickey Mouse signs for a draft bill in Brazil, it could be uh, generate uh, mistrust in in the system. Um, the first one, uh, we address this question uh, thinking about the costs of the fraud in the system. Uh, maybe one, one, uh, someone can register as Mickey Mouse building a prepaid uh, SIM card and take an electoral ID that one, not, one information is necessary to sign draft bills in Mudamos uh, for another person and register as Mickey Mouse. But if, even if you ha can have one uh, fraud registration, uh, it's hard to think uh, someone will try to uh, break the entire system. So gathering one and a half million signatures as Mickey Mouse, as Minnie Mouse, and Pato Donald, and all those things, and all those characters. Um, and this is uh, important because one and a half million, and if you uh, pay for a, SIM, a different SIM card for one and a half million SIM cards, uh, you have a, a high, high cost, uh, more than uh, some, sometimes we joke, is more um, affordable or more easy to buy a congressman in Brazil than uh, uh, fraud. Uh, mudamos. Um, but the second one uh, is a legal, uh, uh, a, a legal uh, response to your, your question. The attribute or the role to verify the signatures uh, legally is uh, f uh, of the, con the legislative house, the Congress, uh, National Congress of Brazil. So what we do with Mudamos is offering for the, the legislative house all the, the tools to verify this information and all, uh, they can also check if uh, Mickey Mouse have an electoral ID and it, if this information is true and, and can, can do it in an autom automatic way. Uh, so uh, even if the, there is a chance to fraud the system, it is more reliable, uh, 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 more reliable than you have the paper way uh, of sign because Mickey Mouse also can sign in paper. So uh, this is an our arguments to defend. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. So um, normally we have uh, in the slide deck we have one slide dealing with legal issues <laughs> and there are many right so i mean gdpr is just one uh, item that uh, we're going to have to figure out and and quite often anyway i make the joke is that larry lesser he gave us code is law but law is code is equally important and that's what we actually see right now is that certain kinds of legal frameworks are probably going to determine how the code eventually is going to look like and so gdpr is one um, the, the presence of electronic signature laws, for instance, is another important uh, uh, legal enabler or disabler, depending on how the law uh, predicts what the conditions are for being considered uh, uh, valuable, uh, val uh, valid. And, um, uh, and so I have no, anyway, um, uh, no immediate um, um, guidance uh, if you're looking for GDPR compliance, which I would never uh, be capable of doing anyhow. Um, uh, except for saying it's going to be a challenge. And it's very interesting is that GDPR is actually used right now to promote uh, self-sovereign identities. Uh, so that you can actually say is that the whole concept of self-sovereign identities is actually being seen as an empowerment of the individual uh, uh, who then can control what is being shared or what is being deleted or not. And so uh, many in the blockchain community on the one hand, see GDPR both as a threat, but also as actually an enabler of uh, establishing uh, more user control through self-sovereign identity. So it has both sides 
uh, from my point of view. There are other legal questions. One that I think the community should also think about is the massive patenting that is going on right now. Uh, meaning blockchain is being patented or, or any kind of <laughs> line of code uh, uh, is, uh, is being patented right now, which might have implications for the civic tech community on how you actually experiment uh, and uh, adjust uh, some of those uh, uh, technologies. Yeah, no, I, obviously the political economy in which the technology is being developed is crucial and needs to be understood more. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, I think it does provide you, quite often new technologies provide you with like a new kind of uh, imagination uh, on how you could deal with existing systems. The question is, uh, can the technology then uh, ultimately establish the promise? And I think that's then, anyway, up to experimentation and seeing how it evolves. Uh, but obviously, anyway, existing uh, uh, power structures are important uh, and might actually be strengthened, uh, again, uh, through blockchain, because uh, it's not like a neutral technology, right? I mean, so anyway, it's ultimately how it is being used and the values that are embedded in the technology. Maybe, maybe just quickly add, I think one of the things we do see is that there's definitely interest from states that are risk have risk of getting cut off out of uh, global US dominated financial markets. Some of these countries are interested in seeing a vi viable crypto market for financial transactions globally. So um, Venezuela launched a cryptocurrency that turned out not to be a cryptocurrency, but there was lots of speculations that this was of interest to both shape ideologically by some uh, some countries around the world, as, as but also technically start building it, um, and that is also a conversation around, for example, the viability of Swift in the future, and uh, and some of those questions. That doesn't really touch on on, on the thing of sort of granular transactions, but uh, the the whole question around developing an alternative crypto markets, I think even past the bust of Bitcoin, there will be a sustained interest from this because of the effect of sanctions. It's It sounds like our break has started, but I know there's a few more questions in the room. Um, I wanted to take at least one more question, and then these guys will be around, so you can you can absolutely come up to them, I hope, <laughs> and, and talk to them about things. Um, who wants to, yeah.
guess I'm just adding that security is another huge variable in this one that I think we need to take very seriously and not allow the conversation like this is the security thing on the planet. And just one very final thought, because I think we're running a really difficult line on this agenda, which is overcoming my internal snark and actually genuinely engaging with it, which is what you guys have done, whilst still debunking appropriately. And I think that there's a difficult, and I think it's probably something as a community we need to talk a little bit more, more about engage versus debunk versus um, um, uh, the, the kind of uh, actually using it <laughs> um, agenda and how we do that. So thank you for starting. I think it's really important. Great, thank you. On the second point, I think uh, agree completely. On the first, um, that's an issue that we didn't really speak about too much in our presentation, at least, is that question of what information is held on chain and what information is held off chain. And that's another of these huge variables and design principles that can have massive implications on privacy security concerns. So uh, the point, yeah, very well taken. Um, and uh, specifically about the, what information is on-chain and is off-chain, uh, we need to care about the costs of the put the information on-chain. It's very, very uh, expensive to to put those information. In, uh, with Mudamos, we uh, split uh, the information, uh, what is on-chain and off-chain, because uh, of the costs to do everything on chain. Firstly, we want to uh, put every signature on chain. So uh, we, we, we could take off all the, the systems and servers of uh, uh, ITS and every signature will uh, pop, pop, up, pop up from the, 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 the smartphone to the uh, blockchain of the Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, blockchain. But the costs uh, are very, very high to do it. So we split and and have storage uh, the the signatures for a period, and weekly we deploy those signatures in a intermediate uh, file, uh, a public file that a list of signature that this is uh, assigned uh, the, the 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 file sig signature. Uh, that is only the information is is, is put on chain. So we had le less than eight bytes uh, uh, published on chain, and and this is how can we make this information verifiable? Uh, it's a it's a, a question of design. I think um, when blockchain. Uh, uh, Push forward the the, the, the technology the, the technology limitations. We have uh, uh, as more as possible informations on chain, but this depends on the technology evolution. I think that's all the time we have. Um, thank you so much for joining. Thanks to the panelists. Um, and enjoy. Thanks. Thank you, Paul.